Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Emergence and Empowerment Global Conference, in which you will be immersed in the wisdom, expertise, and breakthrough inspiration from more than 30 radical leaders, change agents, and influencers. My name is Jocelyn Mercado, and I'm your host and the co-producer of this event. And you are invited here in this sacred space to dive in deep and to gain a profound understanding of the secrets, insights, and pathways that we can collectively create in order to move through our current challenging times and birth a new way forward. Prepare to be revolutionized and supported, body, mind, heart, and soul. You will learn potent ways that you can expand your leadership and actively participate in accelerating humanity's awakening so that together, we can manifest our true potential for a bright and vibrant future. And today I am thrilled to welcome Priya Matani. Welcome Priya. Thank you so much for being a part of this event. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. Yes, and I am super excited about your topic. So let me introduce you to everybody. Priya Matani is a writer, communications consultant, and transformational coach living in the UK with her two teenagers. She has a passion for Waldorf education, building community, and supporting individuals and organizations to communicate more effectively by deepening authentic connections and speaking from the heart. Priya has been passionate about building community and alternative education since 1999 when she lived and worked in the community of Auroville, South India, which is a 50 plus year old growing international township made up of people from over 40 different countries. And I recently heard that they are um, money, like it's a, a cash free or money free society, right? Which In is, places. <laughs> yeah, which is fascinating. Um, for the last 13 years, Priya has worked alongside Steiner Waldorf schools in the UK, exploring resources and strategies to help children thrive. In 2019, she created and produced an online education summit called Festival of the Child to help children thrive and navigate these changing and uncertain times. Her business, School of Sophia, is a modern day sanctuary for parents and educators, offering transformative events, online courses, and community to deepen your connection to yourself, each other, and the world. Their mission is to awaken the heart of our shared humanity by empowering parents and educators with practical tools and heart wisdom so that together we can reimagine what raising children in the 21st century with consciousness looks like. And Priya, uh, as I said already, I'm so excited about your topic today. This is so deeply needed at this time. So your topic is shifting the learning paradigm, support, sustenance, and sanity for parents juggling children, work, and school at home. So can you share with us what do you see as some of the challenges facing today's parents? And this has gotten far more complicated within the last couple of months here with our, our global pandemic. Well, I wanted to say that, first of all, my heart really goes out to all parents listening to us right now, because how many of us have heard in the last few weeks that we're living in unprecedented, uncertain, extraordinary, crazy times? But that has never been as true, as you said, as it is right in this moment. Um, Vladimir Lenin said, I've got a quote here, I've just written it down. There are decades when not much happens and there are weeks when decades happen. Oh, wow. And, yep. and in the last month, I mean, I think the pressure's never been so great. Um, it can feel like literally being in a pressure cooker. Anxiety levels are at all time high for parents and children. And just sitting with all this uncertainty and the unknown is really difficult to face. But I just want to take a few steps back and just really kind of paint a little bit of a picture of where we find children anyway. So children, even prior to this kind of extraordinary crisis we're facing, are already under huge pressure. There was a quote going around from a man called Travis Jordan, who is a public school district superintendent in the States. I'm not sure from where in the States, but he said, I'd have more faith in standardized tests if I knew any standard children. Mm. And I mean, just thinking about that, we're, we're sort of really living in the majority of the world um, with a one size fits all model of education. This is whether you're in kind of the public education in, you know, the state funded um, education in the US or the state funded education here in the UK um, and globally. 
And our children are living increasingly sedentary lifestyles. There's less time for free unstructured play. They're spending way more time sitting, you know, in front of screens and devices. Um, there's a huge uh, more emphasis on testing when they eventually do get to school. And this is relentless. Um, the international speaker and creativity guru, educational advisor, Sir Ken Robinson, that I'm sure many of your listeners will have heard of, um, he spoke in this brilliant TED talk, Why Schools Kill Creativity, or sorry, Do Schools Kill Creativity? And 64 million people have watched that uh, TED talk. I mean, it's well wow. worth re-watching if um, uh, people want to. But what he's basically saying is that the model of education that we have for our children is completely outmoded and was developed in a time where we needed to educate the, the poor especially because we wanted to get mothers and fathers of those poor children into the factories. So really, it was a kind of industrialization of education and it was a way of um, not really looking necessarily at the children, but supporting the economy. Um, and today, governments all around the globe are very heavily focusing on STEM subjects. So that's science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Um, in 2015, there was a commission called the Warwick Commission and it had three key areas culture creativity growth and growth and I just want to quote you something that they shared in that report because I think it's really interesting so they said creativity culture and the arts are being systematically removed from the education system with dramatic falls in the number of pupils taking GCSEs in design drama and other craft related subjects so okay GCSEs are public examinations in the UK that you take at around 16. But I think this is really reflecting a trend that's happening globally. And I think it's really interesting that in this time of lockdown, quarantine, self-isolation, wherever you find yourself, what are we doing? We're all turning online and suddenly the National Theatre here in the UK are live streaming brilliant plays every Thursday evening. Or, you know, I think the Shakespeare's Globe live streamed Hamlet. There are musicals online. You can um, go visit museums all around the globe, get, you know, with virtual tours download books. I think the online community has been so generous and so vibrant in its response to this crisis. But what would we do without all these arts? And repeated governments over years, they slash funding for arts programs. And arts and creativity are so vital for healthy human development. And I'll, you know, share a bit more about that in a minute. So, <clears throat> so that's one thing is the, um, just the environment of, heavy testing and less arts and just a general amount of stress. Um, another thing is stress and depression. I mean, you know, you're a mother of two girls. <clears throat> I know your children are a bit younger than mine. Mine are 30, I have a 13 year old daughter and a, <coughs> excuse me, a 17 year old son. But whether they're in primary school or secondary school, children are increasingly stressed. Children who are not excelling academically necessarily are given less opportunities to succeed in general. Success is often defined as passing examinations. So can you memorize facts and regurgitate them in an exam setting? Um, I was recently interested to listen to my son who was doing GCSE geography. And of course in the UK, GCSEs and A-levels have all been canceled this year, which throws up a whole other set of questions. But he was talking about, you know, that we're studying climate change, and one of the answers, you know, how could we solve climate change was basically reforestation. And he said to me, well, okay, reforestation is, is one possible solution, if you like. But in Oroville, where I used to live for many years, when he was small, where I lived with his father, um, 50 years ago, when the community started, it was a green, uh, sorry, it was an arid desert. And the original settlers, were very kind of tree hugging, environmentally conscious types. So they planted loads of trees and it's now a green belt. But of course they planted lots of species from Australia in particular. And now of course there are all these other issues with having species that are not indigenous to the landscape and how do you remove them? And you know, so that it's, it's a bit more complicated than just saying, you know, solve climate change by reforestation. Um, but in his GCSE geography paper, he's being asked to basically have this very prescriptive, this is the answer, this is what's going to get you the marks. So of course, it's just to give you a small flavour of, I think, some of the challenges that some of these exams set for children. But 
another thing is that one in four girls in the UK, certainly, um, of the age 14 years of age experience depression. This is things like cyberbullying, um, academic pressure are cited as kind of the main reasons why. And there's a university in London called the University College of London, and they did a millennium cohort study, and it analysed information from over 10,000 children. Now, one in four girls, I mean, that's, I, that's in the UK. Um, I can't speak to what the figures are in the US, but I can just share a few bit of information about the, what the World Health Organization is saying. Mm -hmm. And they're basically saying that mental health conditions account for, I think it's 16% of the burden of disease and injury in people aged 10 to 19 years of age. So one, of, one in six people around the world are in that age category, and suicide is the third leading cause of death in 15 to 19 year olds. So we have an absolute crisis going on amongst our children and adolescents. Um, adolescence is such an important time for developing healthy, social, emotional um, habits. And, you know, there's a lot of research in the last, I think the last 10 years that has told us that the teenage brain is not fully developed until age 25. There's another brilliant TED talk that I just want to mention by a cognitive neuroscientist called Sarah Jane Blakemore. And she's basically the professor of psychology at the University of Cambridge here in the UK. And she says that the teenage brain is not developed until 25 years of age or 26 even. So that kind of really turns on its head how we view our adolescents and teenagers. Um, essentially, what I'm saying, though, is that our children and teenagers are totally stressed out. Now, on top of all that, and a system that's completely flawed, we have to bring the same system home into our homes, you know, at the last month. Um, and, you know, if you're lucky enough to have extended family at home who live close by, um, maybe you'll get a bit more support. But of course, now all the guidelines are telling us that the elderly are in a higher risk category. And so if you did have that support previously, now that support is also being taken away from you. And parents, I think, you know, I'm a single parent, so I can certainly relate to this. I mean, I'm very used to my daughter, who's 13, going to my mother's every Saturday night for an evening. It's wonderful for my daughter to have that bonding, connecting time with her grandmother. It's great for my mother, who, you know, my father died two years ago, so you know, she's a widow and that's crucial contact for her too. I get a break and it really works. Well, the last three weeks, I haven't had any break at all and it's I can feel in my own system the pressure and I think that you know never mind if you've got more than one child because of course now schools are sending all sorts of work home luckily here in the UK we're on the Easter holiday so there's a bit of a reprieve but I just think that you know if you've got more than one child then you're juggling different needs di different access requirements you know do they need to be online how many devices have you got and it goes on and on um, so I think those are just sort of a few um, of the issues that we're facing that are really challenging, <clears throat> even before we get into what can we do now that our children are home. And some of us are, of course, juggling work and home at the same time. Yes. Yes. Wow. It really, thank you for sharing the whole picture, the full picture that we're looking at and, and where we were before and then where we are now. And yes, this... Um, change in who's caring, reduction in, in number of people who can help care for the children, especially mm -hmm. if the children are very young. That is huge. And I've, ta I, I've talked to a number of people who that's really affecting. And also there, you know, I'm in a situation right now where my ex-husband and I are in separate households. And so the kids are spending half the time with him and half the time with me. And mm -hmm. that really helps both of us because we're both working from home and both busy with work right now. And I know in some places you're not allowed to let the kids go between the two homes anymore. And that's oh, yes, a bigger shock to the, to the children to have to not yeah. be able to see that other parent and also to both parents in, in different ways. So yes, really challenging. So what do you recommend? What do parents need right now to be able to support their children and stay sane? Well, <clears throat> I think there are, there are a number of factors and obviously, you know, there's a, there's a huge amount of great resources out there. Um, and I really, you know, encourage people to look and see what really works for you. Because of course, 
no one family is the same and what might work for one family is not necessarily going to work for another. But I have, I just have a few, I was thinking about this and I think there are three sort of key things to think about. And the first thing I wanted to say is that this is not homeschooling. It is not even school at home. And, you know, even our teachers, many of them who are wonderful, you know, very knowledgeable, intelligent, dedicated uh, human beings are having to work really hard at having to create something meaningful for children at home. Because, you know, this online medium is just, it's just not historically the way we've um, experienced learning. And teachers are, you know, using things like Google Classroom or MS Teams or Zoom even, or whatever platform they're looking at, but they're having to work really hard to figure out how to make it all work. Um, and the, the thing I wanted to say is that as a parent, you are your child's first teacher. You know, like they say on the airplane, you know, put your oxygen mask on first. Um, I really like that. But it's really important, I think, for parents to know that you have to take care of you. Because if you take care of you first, then you are going to be in a much better position to take care of your families. And I'm saying this out loud, but of course I'm speaking to myself because I'm classically a parent who gets very caught up in work and busy, busy, busy. And I really have to be very conscious to, to do the things to take care of myself um, in order to show up better uh, for my children. You know, I'm totally put my hands up. I'm guilty of pushing myself too hard and, you know, not slowing down. But I think in order for me to be a better mother to my teenagers and for parents to be better parents, which is, of course, you know, our children are so precious to us. And that's what, you know, I've spoken to so many parents over the years. And what's the thing they say all the time? I just want my child to be happy. I mean, it's, you know, I, th I think that we're all, you know, so many millions of parents now sitting at home also just longing for their children to be happy. But in order for our children to be happy, we have to prioritise our own well-being. And I think it's not easy for parents, um, particularly mothers, because we're so used to sacrificing and putting our children first. And, you know, this can lead to resentment and frustration, and that can come out in unhealthy ways. Um, you know, maybe angry outbursts directed at children or imploding and becoming depressed. Um, obviously, there are lots of different scenarios, but I just really want to stress the point that I think it's so important um, that parents find ways of taking care of themselves. I mean, it could be a simple thing like joining an online yoga class or going for a walk by yourself, you know, assuming that restrictions in your area allow you to do so. Um, one of the things I found for me is to get creative. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, it's not about being the next Van Gogh or, you know, um, it, it's, it's just really about finding space to express and share one's own creativity. We are all creative beings, despite what some of us might have heard at school to convince us otherwise. But essentially, creativity is part of our essential human nature. And so finding ways to tap into that creativity, maybe it's just, you know, um, baking or, you know, coming up with a fun recipe or, you know, making a beautiful affirmation and coloring it in. It really doesn't have to be fancy and it doesn't require expensive accessories or ingredients or equipment. I think it's just finding what what makes you feel good and nourished on the inside so that when it comes to your children, you are resourced enough to be able to tend to their needs. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing um, is take the time to connect with others. I mean, I've especially noticed this too, as a single parent, you know, being in all the time with my children, I am starved of adult company and you know, I think it's really important for parents to get the support that they need, ask for help. It's really, really critical. And there are so many other parents just like you out there going through exactly the same thing. It's very easy as a parent to think that, you know, this is only me. This is my scenario. Everything's falling apart. I can't cope. But actually, if you just reach out and ask for help and support, it will always, you know, if it's that thing, ask and it shall be given. There's always help and support available to us. And I think that, you know, there are lots of different types of online supportive groups out there. But even if it's as simple as calling one friend and saying, can we meet every Thursday at six o'clock in the evening, just for half an hour and take the time to really listen to each other. I know it sounds 
really simple and almost too simple and obvious for words. But I do think some of the most powerful ways to stay sane in these times um, are really simple. Um, and the third and final thing I just wanted to say was to be really gentle with yourselves. You know, this is an extraordinary time on planet Earth. I don't think we've ever seen, I, I know you've spoken about this extensively for years, you know, we've never seen a, a time where we, we are forced to come into this togetherness in a way that we just haven't experienced before. And it is a huge challenge that's brought us here, but there's a tremendous wave of solidarity flooding the earth. I mean, we can see it with the Italians singing on the balconies of Italy or the uh, Spanish folk doing workouts on their rooftops. You know, in the UK here, we clap for the NHS on Thursday evenings. You know, it, it doesn't really matter what it is, but there is this huge sense of togetherness that is really um, available. But I think it's really important to be gentle with oneself and to, um, you know, to forgive ourselves when we make mistakes, because we're going to make mistakes. We're having to adjust to new rhythms and routines. And I think it's important to, you know, figure out what do those rhythms and routines look like? You know, and if you can't work out a good rhythm or you work something out and then it all falls apart, that's okay too. You know, it's like, it, it's just really being very present moment to moment. What is going on today? What is manageable today? If it, if it works, great. And if it doesn't, you know, to be kind to ourselves and to let it go and move on. But I think, you know, it's, I think it's really can be as simple as taking time to, to be creative, taking time to connect with others and take time to really have compassion for ourselves because it, it is an unprecedented, crazy, extraordinary time. Definitely, yeah, I love everything you've said here, Priya, and I think we, we definitely need to have a lot of patience and just kindness toward ourselves, as you have said, because we're, we're under so much stress now as parents. Mm. And our kids are, you know, it's, it's tough to be cooped up in an, in an apartment, you know, all the time or, or just in one house. And I know my kids have their friends down the street and they're not able to play with them. I, you know, there, there are, um, that was a decision I made and that, and that they also made the same decision and it's, you know, we're not letting them play together just to try mm -hmm. to protect everybody in the, in each family. So yeah, unprecedented for sure. So what do our, what do our children need most? Then. Well, I, I just wanted to piggyback off the, just something you said about your children not being able to play with their friends. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that is so huge. Children are such yeah. social creatures yeah. and they learn so much from their peers. And I think this is the thing about, you know, this is not homeschooling. This is not school at home because school is a place where children gather in community social. and experience this social interaction. It is so fundamental to their health and well-being. And of course, you know, now they just have us and, you know, your children are a bit younger, but certainly my teenagers don't find me that fun and exciting to hang out <laughs> with anymore. Um, and yet that I'm pretty much all they've got these days because of course they're not allowed to see their friends for understandable reasons. Yeah. Um, so I think that we have to really think about how we can support them. And it's very interesting that if you, I've spoken to some teachers who've worked in China and also who looking at the research that's coming out of China, who of course are a bit more ahead of us in terms of where they are with this current crisis. And one of the things that's really clear is the incredible preciousness of children's mental and emotional well-being and how that's an area that has really, you know, children have really suffered. So I think that you know, part of being really kind to ourselves and kind to our children is recognizing that they suddenly have lost all their, okay, yes, they can keep in touch with FaceTime and Skype and Zoom, but it's really not the same thing, um, particularly for children. Um, so I think that's just something important to bear in mind. Yeah, what yeah, definitely. It's just, it's not the same as, you know, I would be so happy when they were outside running around the, the yard with their friends, mm. riding bikes, you know, and it, yeah, FaceTime is not the same. Mm. So, yeah, well, what, what uh, do our children need most? Well, um, I think what they need is really to know that they're safe, that they're loved and that they're supported. Um, this is going to be a huge amount more difficult if you are struggling yourself and don't feel supported yourself. 
and I, you know, I think we can all from our own experience of parenting, parenting is the most rewarding, magical, beautiful journey. And it is also the most challenging, triggering and difficult. Um, I would say, depending on their age, keep exposure to news and media to a minimum. I know from, for, as an adult, in the beginning of this crisis, I pretty much consumed every bit of news and information you could possibly find. And it made my head spin and I started having anxiety attacks and panicking and not able to sleep. Um, and then I did the opposite and went on a complete, I'm not watching anything. And I regained some balance and then slowly I have you know, found a middle way. Um, but I think that we have to be sensitive to the fact that children don't have the same capacities that we do, particularly younger children, to absorb information and news. I think there are lots of age appropriate ways of communicating with children. Um, healing stories can be one. There are lots of great resources online for that. Um, and children, particularly primary school age children, they really don't need very complicated explanations for things. It's really okay to say something very simple to a child um, because they're going to accept that at face value. And I think other things are get children involved in household tasks like it's a great time to learn to do laundry I mean who doesn't love doing laundry right <laughs> definitely especially because I don't have time to do my laundry anymore no, no, I know. <laughs> I know. I've outsourced mine to my son um, that's great <laughs> um, um so simple tasks now how does the washing machine work do, does your child even know you know just very simple things uh, cooking together playing board games creating simple rituals. You are not a replacement teacher as a parent. You are a parent. It's really okay to relax rigid schedules and it's really okay to not have strict timetables for things. I think we all have to learn to be really flexible during this time. And, you know, we just can't replicate a classroom at home. It's just not going to be possible. And I think it's also really important to rest. And I think teaching our children that rest is important is actually, you know, it's like it goes against the grain of society, you know, and the busy, busy that we're constantly um, in as a um, sort of global family. And um, the other thing I wanted to say is that ch our children are probably scared too. You know, maybe a parent has lost work or is worrying about the future. How are they going to survive? How are they going to pay bills? But children need to be safe and protected. So I think, you know, using this time to teach life skills, you know, even thinking about sewing or just very basic, simple things, gardening, plant a little kitchen garden. Um, those can be really practical. I mean, another idea is to ask your children to keep a journal for these times. You know, it could be just pictures or short sentences or, you know, cut up from magazines. Um, just something, idea. Yeah, just something to to give them a, a space to express what's going on for them. Because we will look back on these times in the not too distant future, let's hope, when we will come out of this time and it will have been an extraordinary time for everybody. Um, I think the most important thing I want to say is that it's more important to support emotional well-being over academic learning right now. You know, if they don't want to do something, let them drop it. You can always come back to it later. You know, learning really doesn't have to be strict right now. Um, I think also, you know, we all need a break. I read this, um, or no, a parent in fact told me this, that in their neighbourhood, each, it's a, it's a small kind of suburban neighbourhood, somewhere in the States, and they had decided as families that they'd all put a teddy bear in the window. And the families could then walk around looking for the bears in the neighborhood. Uh -huh. And obviously it's keeping safe distances and then waving, you know, at children behind the windows. Mm -hmm. But I just thought it was such a sweet little simple idea that could, you know, developed in a small community. But it's just really a way of still connecting to the larger world without really, you know, having to, with, whilst maintaining all the safe, you know, physical distancing things. That's that really beautiful. To. Yeah. Um, and another couple of ideas are things like keeping art portfolios. A Waldorf teacher recently told me, you know, why not study a tree or a flower in your garden if you have one or in a, a pot in a plant and just make some drawings. You know, it's a very simple, easy way to get creative. You don't even need colored pencils. You could just even use a pencil or a pen. You know, there are lots of studies that show how nourishing creativity is for human beings. Um, and I think that 
you know, I just think in a way, it, it, this is really returning us to uh, looking at things from a much more simple way. You know, what is kind of fundamentally nourishing and supportive for children and families and, you know, accessing creativity, taking time to rest, just being with each other in ways that feel good without so much pressure uh, can be really helpful. Yeah, these are some beautiful ideas. Thank you, Priya. I love, I love what you've shared here. Um, and definitely agree with you that it's, we, we should prioritize the emotional security, you know, emotional well-being of our children above the academic standards at this time, because we all need the emotional <laughs> well-being to be prioritized. And when we do that for them, we're going to mm -hmm. also be doing that for ourselves too. So that's really, really powerful. Um, so is there a hidden gift among these challenging times that we're navigating here? Well, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think that we are in a time of a huge, uh, pause, like it's a tremendous pause. It's an understatement really, isn't it? Yeah. Life, life, life as we know it has come to a grinding halt. Um, and we have an opportunity to radically rethink as you're sharing in this summit and you know all the work that you've been doing it's a radical opportunity to look at well what is working and what isn't working and how are we going to find our way um two years ago my father died and i'm still processing the grief from his death and what ensued in the weeks and months that followed after he died was a complete turning upside down of my world you know it's grief stirred so much in me old angers frustrations resentments um feelings of abandonment it was a very intense time and you know it, it still is in places because it was only two years ago so i'm still cycling through that during that same time my son's school that he'd been in since he was four he's 17 now um closed it would have been 70 years of 70 years old a relationship ended client work changed i mean it was a real radical rethink of my entire existence but okay so why am i telling you this the thing is that during this time it was only by feeling all those feelings that were really difficult and uncomfortable like the hurt the anger the betrayal the abandonment i could go on it's a long list mm -hmm. um that I could begin to make more sense of my world. And I think, and the trajectory I was on as a human being. And I think that collectively, we are also going through this huge shift. You know, the, the entire planet is unraveling in a process of, I, I feel, a, a collective grief cycle. Because everything that we've not wanted to look at and face, now we're having to be more still and quiet in our own homes. It's all coming up. And that's really difficult. You know, we're living in the same house with the same people and there's not so much room to go out. It's inevitable that these deeper feelings and unresolved things are going to get triggered and stirred up. And so I think that, you know, aside from being really gentle with ourselves, because we're going through the shift together, I think it's an incredible opportunity as well, given that we have no choice, right? This is where we are. The reality on the ground is you can kick and scream and fight and shout as much as you like, but you're still going to be in your house, you know, in quarantine or lockdown or isolation and have to face these things. So I think that, you know, this really is an, an incredible opportunity to see what's true for each person, what's living in your soul, what, what's working in your life and what's not. Maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a place of work, maybe it's the way you work. I mean, I think... It, it doesn't really matter what it is. Each, for each person listening, it will be something different. And it, maybe it's one thing or a few things. And it's not a comfortable process. You know, like the story with my father's death, I've had to face things that have been really difficult and learn to sit with the abandoned child in me or, you know, seeing how that small abandoned child part has played out in so many parts of my own life. And I think that, you know, that's, the the gift of this time even if it's coming in an unwelcome package and you know some days are going to be easier than others some days it's really okay when things fall apart but i think you know this opportunity to really connect to what's true to us on the inside um and what what is it when we come out of this time that we really want to take with us 
you know what is it we want to leave behind you know what was working and what wasn't it's yeah i think that's all i wanted to say about that yeah definitely and it, what is your vision for the highest good that could come out of this for for parents and children as we move forward um well i for me this is twofold um one of the things that I think I really long for is that we find ways to continue to come together and that we find ways of listening and hearing each other's wisdom. I know that as a community, a global community, we are so resourceful. We are so creative. We are powerful, amazing, incredible human beings. And everything we have, we, it's already within us. We, we just need the time and space, which we have plenty of, to access those resources on the inside. I do think that our education system in particular is broken. The political system's broken. Our relationship to the earth has become fractured. You know, we're living in a time of tremendous awakening. And I feel that the impulse to evolve right now is so strong, but who knows where it's really gonna go, right? And maybe it takes another hundred years to really ground in the world in which we might like to see. But I think that, this is an opportunity, I know you speak about this a lot, you know, to enter the dreaming space. You know, we can go into these imaginal realms and lean into what feels good in our lives, what's possible, and how, how would we really like to see education, children, life, the future? You know, what, what does that look like? Um, so I think that means taking time to get to know what's in our deepest hearts and in what's in the deepest hearts of others. You know sharing just our dreams and longings because I think that's so important um, and the second thing I want to say is that I think that when we go back to school my big deepest wish is that it's not going to be business as usual you know I, I really I feel so passionate about this that we have to rethink education reimagine what's possible for children and parents and families and I think you know obviously this is a, a longer term vision if you like um, there's a man called Professor Jem Bendel, and he is part, he's a professor of sustainability leadership and sustainability and leadership at the University of Cumbria here in the UK. And he talks about the need for deep adaptation. Some of your listeners might have heard about him and his work, because I think he wrote about it and it went quite viral. And he said in response to the environmental crisis, um, he's looking at deep adaptation through the lens of four R's and they are re resilience, relinquishment, restoration and reconciliation. So I took his four R's and I've adapted them slightly for education. So I just like to share them with you. Um, so resilience, you know, what remains valuable in our schools and curriculum, whether it's mainstream public education, state funded education, an alternative system like Waldorf or Montessori or something entirely different, what's worth keeping and how do we do that? Mm. So, you know, the next one's relinquishment. What's no longer working in the classroom with children and teenagers today, even if it actually once did, um, just because it works in the past doesn't mean that it's uh, going to work now. And how do we do, um, and how do we let go? What do we need to let go of? Um, the third thing is restoration. So what are the topics and areas of attention that we need to focus on um, that need restoring? What has been lost from our conscious awareness and is either no longer taught or considered unimportant? I mean, how many children, for example, learn practical skills in schools or how to, you know, manage accounts or tend to a garden? Um, obviously, there are lots of other ideas. And the fourth and final thing um, is reconciliation. So what do we as parents and communities and teachers and children still need to make peace with? You know, where are the spaces in each of us as adults and in our communities that need healing and attention? You know, we're, for any parent part of a school community, you know, there are always issues that arise, you know, as in any workplace. And I think that it's really important um, to find those places and spaces where we can come to resolution. It doesn't mean we have to agree with each other, but I think that healing and um, listening to each other is going to be really key. Um, I just wanted to say that I really imagine a world where our children get to be children, you know, where childhood is 
unhurried, stress-free. It's not a race to the finish line. Children get to do things like climb trees and, you know, just be themselves. And I'm kind of imagining an education where access to resources that help children to thrive and help their emotional and um, mental well-being to, to be fully supported are available for all children from all backgrounds, regardless of how much access to resources you happen to have or where in the world um, you live. I also really strongly feel that, you know, a child's innate sense of curiosity and creativity and um, innocence is, uh, these, are, these are kind of like, it's like the gold dust of, of childhood and parenting. And what are the things that we can do as communities to support our children to develop and deepen in these attributes so that they can be, you know, willing contributors for the good of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, a, a, an educational um, advisor and author and lecturer, Christopher Clowder, um, who is very much a mentor and someone I respect a great deal. He said that we are all educators, you know, not just the teachers, that we are all educators. And I really, I really appreciate this reflection because he's, it's this idea that, you know, we can experience a reverence for each other's innate wisdom and knowing, you know, we can experience reverence and appreciation for the planet that we're living in and all its inhabitants, including the plants and the animals. And mm -hmm. I'm sort of dreaming and imagining a world where we can really, um, yeah, support each other in this journey towards wholeness. And I think that from that place, what kind of a world can we create, you know, with, with those sorts of ideas at the core? Um, I'm an optimist, um, so I can't help but think that way. But I think, you know, I just think of that famous, you know, John Lennon song, you know, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. You know, it's, I think that this is the time for all the dreamers of the world to come together and really birth even through a, a heart, a, a deep heart vision and longing, what that new world might look like. Yes, yes, yes. I love this. And um, one thing that stood out to me was you mentioned uh, children not being so rushed anymore. And that, it for me, has been one of the blessings of this time. Mm. Because always, you know, I always, every morning, every weekday morning, it's, okay, hurry up get your ass, get your backpack, mm -hmm. eat breakfast quick, you know, eat quicker. And I'm like, what am I telling my kids? But we got to get them to school on time. So, and then even in the summer, it's like, okay, get ready. We got to go to summer camp. We got to get you to daycare. And it's felt like such a blessing that we all can sleep in a little bit because nobody has to be racing off anywhere. And even if I'm working, you know, we're all just staying here. They can be in their PJs. And, and I can get up and do my work, you know, so it's been really beautiful to see that and to feel like they're more nourished by sleeping in and they're not, I'm not rushing them. It's really, really fun. So thank you for pointing that, that one out. Well, I, you know, I just totally wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I noticed that my 13 year old in particular, she's just way happier you know, because she just has more time to breathe. And I think that childhood is such a precious time in our children's lives, and it really does go too fast. Mm -hmm. And why do we want to force them into this rushed, busy, mad, crazy it's lifestyle? Crazy. That clearly not, we don't like it. it. <laughs> we don't like it, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for all you have shared here. This is, this is so powerful, so needed. And so do you have a Facebook group, right? Is there a Facebook group that people could go, parents could go and get support around this? Or what do you recommend? Sure. This community? Yeah, so I've got a Facebook page. It's a community okay. page that I set up in 2013. And it's called Imagine a School Where. And there we just share lots of, I mean, it's really a curated page. So we share lots of resources about different articles from all sorts of sources that parents might find useful to help them um, navigate whatever's arising in this moment. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And then I've got a separate little um, Facebook group called Waldorf and Friends, which is really, you know, I'm a passionate supporter of Waldorf education um, and other sort of methodologies and approaches. And so it's just really a community space for people who are particularly interested in that approach to come together and share resources too. 
Okay, well, we'll include the uh, links to both of those, the Facebook page and the Facebook group below your interview. So for everybody listening, just scroll down if you would like to check those out. And Priya, I know you have a beautiful free gift for us, which is a one hour interview on supporting parents and, and children and educators through COVID-19. Could you share a little more about that? Sure, so I've teamed together with uh, Dr. Torin Binza, who is an extraordinary and voluminous Waldorf educator of more than 40 years um, thinker. And we're really just um, coming together throughout April in a series of conversations. They're really discussions and places for parents and teachers to just um, come together and share what's going on. So I wanted to offer anybody listening who's interested um, the first interview in that series, um, which you can get instant access to if you just sign up on the appropriate links. Beautiful. And what if people want to hear more of the series? Where can they go? So they can go to our website, which is www.schoolofsophia.org. Okay. Awesome. So many amazing resources and, and yeah, so much important information you have shared here. Deep gratitude, Priya. Thank you so much for being a part of Emergence and Empowerment. Thank you so much. It's always great speaking to you. And I'm really just honored to be a part of, you know, the incredible work that you're doing. It's so important and so needed. And I know that so many families and so many people listening are going to benefit um, infinitely thank from you. all that you're sharing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to all our listeners out there. I hope you've gotten so much out of this interview and uh, we will see you again soon.